My King is coming soon. Can you say amen? amen. Thank you, Shannon Doans. Thank you for your great rendition of the hope that we have in our hearts. The director of this fine group is the son of Nita and Billy Biaggi. So we have a general conference connection here. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a wonderful privilege to see so many of you here together at this 2023 annual council where we are focused on mission. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been uniquely chosen for mission by God himself. The world, the societies around us, the cultures in this world are disintegrating at a rapid pace. We've just heard of the tragic developments in the country of Israel with Hamas. Thank you, Robert, for praying for that and for many other situations. At our upcoming general conference session in 2025, our theme is Jesus is coming, I will go. Because of Christ's saving power and his soon return, Let's say, Lord, thank you for choosing me for your mission to the world. Yes, I will go. This message today is not an easy one to present to you. I ask for your patience, your indulgence, and your loving kindness because we will address various issues that have to do with the sanctity and authenticity and foundational understanding of this word. It is the word of God. The two songs, the two hymns we're going to be singing, we sang one already, have been specially chosen. Oh, brother and sister, be faithful. Soon Jesus will come, for whom we have waited so long. Oh, soon we shall enter our glorious home and join in the conqueror's song. Oh, brother and sister, be faithful. For why should we prove unfaithful to him who hath shown such deep, such unbounded and infinite love who died to redeem us his own. O oh, brother, O oh, sister, be faithful. Seventh-day Adventists have been uniquely chosen for mission to proclaim the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 4, with Holy Spirit power. We are God's remnant church, outlined in Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, we are joined with God in this last proclamation to the world. Revelation 17, 14 indicates those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Oh, brother, oh, sister, be faithful, for you are called and chosen. First Peter Chapter 2, verse 9, explains, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. Now, God tells us in numerous places in this word about being chosen. Let's, let's look at a few of them. John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Isaiah 43, 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. My servant whom I have chosen. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, and 4. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, knowing, beloved brethren, your election, you've been chosen by God. What an enormous privilege to be called and chosen by God to deliver the last warning to a perishing world. And as we were reminded this morning again, everything is perishing. The spirit of prophecy is very clear on this point. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 138. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world. It's like a, a, a mine, like a place where rock is collected and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world. So, brothers and sisters, fellow leaders, and those watching on live streaming, wherever you may be, we have been chosen for mission. You can't see it too well. Perhaps we should have featured it a little more. It says, chosen for mission, our special theme for this annual council. Now, in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, one of my favorite quotations, it's been used before in the last few days. I want to tell you what a blessing it's been to be part of the annual council this year. The amazing lead up, uh, many of you were not with us, last Sabbath, Sunday, Monday, the general conference and division officers met in this room, in the room upstairs, focusing upon the beautiful, beautiful truths of God's Word. We prayed together. We focused on some of the truths that are being attacked. It was a precious experience. In fact, in the future, we're going to spend more time studying the Word of God as general conference and division officers and praying together to remind ourselves of this amazing biblical truth. Thank you for the wonderful lead conference, for the amazing mission trip that we took last night, for the Sabbath school this morning. Brothers and sisters, we have been enriched, and we have our annual council continuing tomorrow through Wednesday. We have packed this annual council with mission because we are chosen for mission. Volume 9, page 19. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. 
So my friends, this is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church exists and has been chosen to proclaim the three angels' messages on God's mission. Mission has always been a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first missionary to be sent from the church was John Nevins Andrews, one of the finest biblical scholars the church has ever produced. He was also a general conference president. Today, we are celebrating the 160th anniversary of the organizing of the general conference itself in 1863. And the 100th, 150th anniversary next year in 2024 of the formal church mission service by the Andrews family. You see, we have been chosen for mission. Since the, that time, the church has globally grown exponentially with missionaries going from everywhere to everywhere. Over 22 million members and local missionaries. Everyone is a missionary for Christ. God's global work is flourishing because we are chosen for mission. Nothing can stop God's mission. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall my word be that, go, that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So when you go on God's mission, proclaiming his word, you will not fail. Now the devil tries everything to hinder the mission of the church today, including violence, just heard about it today, hostile environments, persecution, discouragement, confusion, internal bickering, distractions, false doctrines, attacks against God's people. Let me tell you, this is a very handy device. But if you were here this morning, you heard Melody Mason say, we need to surrender these to God. Because they can be so destructive. You go online, you can hear all kinds of weird things about church leaders and about me. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, we don't worry about that because we're chosen for mission. So we have internal and external disagreements and denigration of the word of God. I'll tell you this morning, as we proceed, I'm going to be really focusing on that particular area. The denigration of God's word. The neutralization of God's word. And all kinds of other angry assaults, including misinformation and outright false allegations against God's work. You know, various people or organizations, they, they attack God's church, twisting facts and misrepresenting the very character of God's remnant church. There seem to be people who just specialize in that. They just live to make others look bad. Now, our church members worldwide, your church members, our church members, represented by our 13 world divisions, our three attached unions, and our one attached field. That one attached field is the Israel field. Let's continue to pray for that field. But our church members worldwide get confused about societal trends and challenges to God's word. And these confusing interruptions tend to derail God's mission as entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
So for the next number of minutes, let's look at some of the confusing interruptions and specific answers that I will give to you to help refocus us back on the full mission of the church. Now, many of the following items that we're going to be looking at will be further shared through my column in the Adventist world in global view. We have a monthly presentation every month. And in this one, there are three of the ones that we're going to cover. In the next month, we will cover about eight more of them. And I'm giving you a preview today on these items. That's why it's a little difficult to present them to you, but our people need to know. Now, in the written presentations, there will be more references, backup, etc., than today. Today, I'm just going to share with you specific indications in my sermon. We're also producing and will be producing short videos to help our church members worldwide know Bible truth and where we stand on issues and that we are focused on God's final commission since we are chosen for mission. Now, please carefully take note of these following confusing interruptions by the devil. And I want to tell you, I am not placing myself before you today as the ultimate answer to all of these items. I am sharing with you from my heart today because you as church leaders and God's people need to know where we stand today. Number one, a lack of understanding the Bible, how to interpret it, and antagonism against the very Word of God. You see, the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes in the authenticity and authority of God's Word, the Holy Bible. And it is to be applied to all people, everywhere, for all time. The church accepts only, I want to underline that, only the historical, biblical, or historical, grammatical method of interpreting Scripture, allowing the Bible to interpret itself line upon line, verse upon verse, precept upon precept, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me warn you, and I've done this before, but I want you to get it into your mind. We are under attack by the historical critical method or any other method of biblical interpretation which is unacceptable to Seventh-day Adventists because those methods are not God-focused methods, but rather humanistic. You see, you become the determiner in the historical critical method of determining what is truth and what is not. But I urge you, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you in understanding Scripture. Use only the historicist approach when understanding biblical prophecies. Not the preterist, not the futurist, but the historical. The spirit of prophecy indicates that we should read the Bible as it reads. Spiritual Gifts, page 94, indicates God has given sufficient evidence upon which to base faith if he wished to believe. In the last days, the earth will be almost destitute of true faith. Upon the merest pretense, the word of God will be considered unreliable while human reasoning will be received, though it be in opposition to plain scripture facts. Do not be influenced by those who in the church ignore, denigrate, or depreciate the Word of God. 
the Seventh-day Adventist Church membership and its leadership stand strongly on a clear understanding and acceptance of the entire word of God as it reads. Number two, confusion and misinformation about the Godhead and the Trinity. Let me tell you, probably after this sermon, Magdil Perez Schultz, my extremely able assistant, he's the one who receives, or Marilyn Perez, my executive assistant, they will receive messages. Why did Wilson say that? Wilson is wrong. I want to tell you today, I'm telling you from my perspective, what the Bible says. The Trinity. Seventh-day Adventists believe there is one God and that this one God is three co-eternal persons who work together in unity. We fully embrace our fundamental belief number two, which indicates that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and always will be. Make no mistake about it. The divine trinity work in unison as one within the Godhead from eternity to eternity. Allow God to use you, every one of you, to share this wonderful truth of a triune God who is carrying out his plan of salvation for each of us. Number three. And this is perhaps one of the more sensitive items today. Misunderstanding about human sexuality. I want to absolutely underline the fact that all of us are to show respect and care for all people. But the Bible, this precious word of God, is clear on what God's instructions are regarding human sexuality. The Bible indicates that marriage is only, let me underline that again, only between one man and one woman. Aberrations in human sexuality are not acceptable to God. And let's not just focus on LGBTQ. It includes adultery, licentiousness, bestiality, homosexuality, and other alternative, unbiblical, LGBTQ sexual activities, which the Bible indicates, including all of those, those aspects of human sexuality which are against God's word, they are sin. Now, before you get too demonstrative about that, remember, we are all sinners at the foot of the cross. So when we're dealing with these situations, deal with love, with care, with respect, but know what the Bible says. Unfortunately, some individuals today even within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we have some situations. We're working with two divisions and their administrations to care for current challenges in this area. But let me tell you, none of you in all the world divisions are immune to this. But some people are twisting the word of God, such as Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Now, we're not going to go over that today. But some people are advocating that it says what it does not say and does not say what it says. Read the Bible as it reads. I want to tell you, the church 
the Worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church, does not and will not accept individuals as church members or elected church leaders who are not adhering to the biblical understanding and practice of biblical human sexuality. Do not bend to anyone who misuses the Bible and its heavenly instructions found in Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32, Leviticus 18, 32, Leviticus 20, 13, and many, many other texts. You see, God's word asks us to stand firm for what he has indicated as Bible truth on this subject and many other subjects. As with any sinful practice, as outlined in the scriptures, we are to help people who come to our churches, pointing them to the foot of the cross where they can find full forgiveness and a new life in Christ as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us. We can become new creatures in Jesus. As my very dear friend, long-time colleague, Mark Finley, international evangelist and assistant to the president. He says, it is not conversion therapy in the technical sense of the word that we believe in. It is biblical, life-changing conversion through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as another colleague of mine, Willie Oliver, director of our General Conference Family Ministries, says, he and Elaine work together, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not against anyone. It is for what's in the Word of God. Amen. My fellow leaders and church members, those of you watching, we are to show people who come to our churches amazing love from the heart of Christ. We're to respect people and realize that Christ would give his life for all who will come to him, but it is only Christ's power that can overcome sin in our lives and bring us into a right, a right relationship with Christ and through his grace and justifying power his sanctifying righteousness. In our meetings earlier, many of you were not part of it, but GCDO, we were reminded Christ's righteousness, his justifying righteousness and his sanctifying righteousness can never be separated. What a powerful God we serve. Now I want to express just a little more on this particular aspect. I want to read some special texts, Galatians chapter, I'm sorry, um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, as the elect of God, people who are chosen, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. I'm going to say the following words in that spirit. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. People will try to twist 
the words of the Bible. Pastors, teachers, theologians, administrators, even church members, try to twist the words of the Bible. Paul tells us, don't let anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Stay close to the word of God. We have many wonderful theologians in our church. The Biblical Research Institute is a wonderful organization. I have full confidence in BRI. I want you to have full confidence too. We have other theologians, wonderful deliverers of the word of God. But there are some, even within our own ranks, who are twisting the word of God, not as it reads. Stay away from them. In scripture, in fact, it's for our chapter for today and believe his prophets, chapter four, Listen to this amazing counsel. Verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Here it is. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Verse 27, the last verse of that chapter, Proverbs 4, do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. My fellow leaders, church members, theologians, teachers, pastors, healthcare workers, publishing leaders, I don't care who you are. Don't get stuck in the ditches on the right or the left. Look straight ahead. Do not turn to the right or the left because you are chosen for mission. If there are those in this room or those watching online, and there are many leaders all over the world, if you are unable for some reason to not fully trust this book, I'm not saying we don't have differences of opinion on certain things in Scripture. Obviously, we're going to continue to learn throughout, his, throughout eternity when we get to heaven. I'm not talking about small issues that each of us have disagreements on, perhaps as to a certain indication or how to interpret it. I'm talking about our major fundamental beliefs, 28 of them, and I'm talking about reading the Bible as it reads. If you, as a leader, and I'm not only speaking to you in this room, but others who may be watching, but you represent the world leadership. If you, as a leader, cannot accept the word of God as it reads, I urge you to resign your position. I will take that as affirmation to God's word, not to me. I am not wanting a purge. I am not wanting some kind of witch hunt. 
I am wanting, though, and I'm speaking for myself in my position, I want leaders who believe 100% in the full Word of God. Well, let's go on. Number four, confusion on the sanctuary service and righteousness by faith. The earthly sanctuary service given by Moses or given by God to Moses is a direct copy of what is in heaven. The earthly sanctuary service portrays the complete plan of salvation, showing God's great love and the centrality of Christ's sacrifice and grace in the salvation process. The earthly and heavenly sanctuary services are keys to understanding the process of salvation based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Seventh-day Adventists ought to be the foremost in living, uh, lifting up Jesus and his righteousness. Never let anyone say that we are legalists. We are full of Christ's righteousness. It is the very core of the three angels' messages. The church believes that the work of the first apartment of the sanctuary was completed at Calvary when Christ died as the Lamb. The Bible indicates that in 1844, Christ entered the real second apartment of the real heavenly sanctuary to begin the investigative judgment and is currently interceding as our high priest. The sanctuary service shows the complete ministry of Christ lifting up is justifying and sanctifying righteousness as our only path to eternal life. We are not saved by being vegan. I, Nancy and I, try 95% to be vegan. We're certainly vegetarians, which I would offer to all of you as well. But we're not saved by that. We're not saved by our contribution to the General Conference Treasury for the wonderful offering for today. We are saved by the grace and the absolute saving power only of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, soon. Jesus is going to leave the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He's going to take off those priestly robes, and he's going to put on kingly robes. And he's going to come to take us home at his second coming. What a joy to proclaim Christ as our Savior and Lord, who not only saves us, but helps us to grow more and more like him all through his power. Number five, misconceptions about biblical creation. The Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that God created this earth recently in six literal days like our current days. Personally, I'll just tell you this, I fully believe in a short chronology accepting the biblical history and spirit of prophecy indication that this very earth is only about 6,000 years old. The Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath or the Seventh-day Sabbath is the memorial of the creation of that incredible event of creation. And it gives complete meaning to our keeping of the seventh day Sabbath today. The Sabbath points to our creator and redeemer and is a powerful part of each of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Number six, false doctrines that are circulating, and there are many. There are misconceptions and false doctrines circulating about the salvation process. These false doctrines diminish sanctification. One false movement, you may not have heard about it, and that's fine, but it is circulating among some of our university and college campuses. It's called love reality. And it's been teaching this false understanding about Christ's full justifying and sanctifying righteousness. Now, these are derivatives of the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, which Seventh-day Adventists do not believe. Unfortunately, it is promoted that behavior is not important. 
since God loves you and just don't worry about what you're doing as long as you feel embraced by God's love. God's love is powerful, important. But these false doctrines are very dangerous and should not be accepted since they destroy the entire understanding of Christ's justifying and sanctifying righteousness. We are facing, this is my opinion, we are facing the shaking and sifting period in the church right now. There are those who are drifting out of a clear understanding of who we are and what we believe. Do not be tempted with false doctrines that take you away from God's remnant church. We have been chosen for mission. Number seven, loss of the sense of urgency in the Advent movement. In various parts of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there are those who seem to have lost their, their sense of urgency in the second coming of Christ, which should permeate every aspect of Seventh-day Adventist life. The current deteriorating world conditions should awaken us to the urgent need to proclaim the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 in anticipation of Christ's soon return. Jesus indicated three times in Revelation 22 that he is coming quickly. We are living at the end of, the, end of time. So let's live with that sense of urgency that will allow the Holy Spirit to work through each of us, to share the need to fall at the foot of the cross, being prepared for the second coming through the grace of Jesus Christ. Number eight, loss of identity as God's remnant church. Some members seem to have lost the identity of and reason for the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are the remnant church of God, not just another denomination. God called us to lift up Christ and his righteousness by preaching those three angels' messages, turning people back to the true worship of God. He has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a unique movement with a unique message on a unique mission, all centered in Jesus Christ and his mission of salvation. We are called and chosen for mission to prepare people for the Lord's imminent second coming. Do not be confused as to who Seventh-day Adventists are. We are God's special messengers and his remnant church. Do not allow mission drift in our church entities and institutions, which results in loss of identity. And let me speak to all union presidents and division presidents. You are the chairs of our educational institutions. Take an interest in everything about those institutions and especially in what is being taught in our religion classes. Realize that we need to re-energize our entities and institutions because we are chosen for mission. Our name preaches a powerful sermon. It says who we are. It explains where we've come from. Christ, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, creating us. We worship on the seventh day Sabbath. And it says where we're going when we're understanding the Adventist part of it, that we, we're going to be going home to heaven soon. So be excited about being a seventh day Adventist and chosen for mission. Know what that means and share the three angels messages with everyone. Number nine, false accusations about the church's relationship with ecumenism. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is absolutely not involved in compromising ecumenism with other religious bodies or movements. Absolutely underline that. Nothing can compromise our biblical understanding of truth and nothing ever will. We believe in making friends with those in other religious, <clears throat> excuse me, and public groups to help them understand who we are and how we positively contribute to society through following Christ's method of helping people physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. I meet many public officials, and I share with them who Seventh-day Adventists are and what we believe, ending, if possible, and almost all except, with a prayer for these public leaders, their families, their countries. 
What a privilege for all of us to witness for the Lord in many different settings. The presence of Seventh-day Adventists in various groups or public uh, settings with public officials does not in any way imply that Seventh-day Adventists have become ecumenical or given up any fundamental biblical belief or ever will. Even some pictures of events are misrepresented or taken out of context to attempt to show that the church is involved in ecumenism when it is simply involved in public affairs activities, helping share religious liberty values and equating people with the beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. Again, let me assure all of you in this room and those watching, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is absolutely not involved in ecumenism or compromising our biblical beliefs. Do not believe any false accusations that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has become Babylon. Yes, we're sinful. I understand that. We all are. But we're not Babylon. We've never compromised and will not biblical truth. We are God's remnant church with a unique biblical message that will never be compromised. We know what we're going to face in the future. The book, The Great Controversy, tells us. And we believe in the prophetic understanding of our role in the final events of Earth's history, as outlined in the books of Daniel, Matthew, and Revelation. And, of course, that wonderful book, The Great Controversy. I hope you're distributing it. Nancy and I shared that book with a list of family and neighbors just a few weeks ago. I hope you're sharing that book. Number 10, challenges to the authority of the church. The church understands that the Holy Spirit works through structured organizations that were organized by heaven itself. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was uniquely organized as God's last day Advent movement to proclaim the three angels' messages and the final loud cry to a world that is desperately in need of the message of Christ's righteousness, grace, and salvation. The church is built on a representative committee system that allows for the Holy Spirit's direct intervention in how decisions are made. And we will make decisions right in this room and have. The Holy Spirit guides leaders and church members in making decisions. When committee decisions at the worldwide level are made based on biblical and spirit of prophecy instruction and guided by humble prayer, personal opinions and convictions are to be laid aside. Spirit of prophecy tells us that. I could quote that to you. And the authority of the world church is to be respected and accepted. When people or organizations do not follow biblical principles of church authority, the world church cannot simply fire people, or get rid of organizations without a very careful biblical approach of trying to help people realize their mistakes. The church structure is not a command and control or hierarchical administrative arrangement. The church structure is built on common biblical beliefs, policy agreements, and congenial recognition that we work together under the power of the Holy Spirit. Although there are disciplinary measures that can be used, the church works carefully to bring people back to unity in Christ through the Holy Spirit's power. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy are replete with counsel, guiding us to accept the authority of the world church in session, where we make decisions on fundamental biblical beliefs, church manual items, governance decisions, and other specific topics brought to the world church representation. The Spirit of Prophecy speaks about the poison of criticism. To avoid this, we are to work in harmony with God and each other at the local church level, the conference mission level, the union level, and the division level. All decisions, and the world level, all decisions should be made in accordance and cooperation with worldwide church decisions. The authority of the church is found in a worldwide representative process that is directed by the Holy Spirit. With Christ-like humility, we are to respect the authority of the church and all, at all levels as God leads his people in the final days of earth's history. 
We are counseled in the spirit of prophecy, pressed together, pressed together, pressed together. Do not drift into congregationalism. Realize we are a worldwide body of believers proclaiming the Lord's return, united in God's biblical truth and chosen for mission. Number 11, misunderstandings about the role of the spirit of prophecy as given by God through the writings of Ellen G. White. There are constant attacks on the spirit of prophecy as represented by the writings of Ellen G. White. The spirit of prophecy was given by the seventh, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church by God as a precious gift and is as applicable today as when it was written. The voluminous writings of Ellen White were given by God to lead his remnant church in all areas of life, pointing us back to Christ and his holy word. All the writings of the spirit of prophecy are instructive in these last days of earth's history, including such books as Testimonies for the Church and the Great Controversy. I want to tell you, I personally believe every word of God's counsel in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I hope you do too. Unfortunately, there are those who disparage, downgrade, and repudiate the spirit of prophecy. I urge you to have a strong commitment to the reading of the word of God and the spirit of prophecy and follow God's instructions for his last day remnant people who are proclaiming Christ's powerful messages of salvation and prophecy. Number 12, lack of understanding the true meaning of the seventh day Sabbath as God's sign of his creatorship and redemptive power in our lives. Christ's loving plan of salvation produces our loyalty of love to him, resulting in our receiving his seal of the seventh day keeping, as opposed to following the false day of Sunday worship, which results in Babylonian confusion and ultimately receiving the mark of the beast. It's not yet, but it will come. We are to uplift the sanctity and sacredness of the seventh day Sabbath, guarding the edges of the Sabbath, following the injunctions of the fourth commandment, and showing respect to God with appropriate spiritual activities on the Sabbath day. Number 13, and you saw it the other day <clears throat> in our presentation by David Trim. Confusion regarding the state of the dead. Many unbiblical understandings about life after death are being promoted. Many local beliefs around this world confuse people. The occult, spiritualism, and satanic influences are growing. The worldwide entertainment industry promotes spiritualism. Avoid all efforts, evil influences, and programming that destroy the biblical understanding of the state of the dead. The devil plans overwhelming delusions at the end of time through mysticism and unbiblical understandings regarding life after death. Satan will even attempt to duplicate Christ's return. Refute any attempts to overpower your thinking by relying only on what you read in God's word. Number 14. Derision regarding the well-accepted Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the last day prophetic events outlined in Daniel, Matthew, Revelation, and the book, The Great Controversy. There are some who dismiss the historicist prophetic understanding accepted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Don't be deceived into thinking that there are explanations for end-time events other than that shown through Daniel, Matthew, and Revelation, and other books, and by the great controversy. In Revelation 13, <clears throat> the beast from the sea is the papacy, and the beast from the earth with two horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon is the United States, a threefold confederation of apostate Protestantism Roman Catholicism and spiritualism will develop producing a loss of religious liberty as Sunday keeping will be enforced, resulting in the receiving of the mark of the beast by those who do not stand for the Lord and his Bible truth of keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy. Read the biblical prophecies and the book, The Great Controversy, 
and you will be reaffirmed about the end time events. Be a strong advocate of religious liberty and freedom of conscience during these last days of Earth's history. God will triumph and bring his people through very difficult times because we have been chosen for mission. Lack of enthusiasm for direct personal and public evangelistic outreach. As Seventh-day Adventists who are chosen for mission, be active in sharing your faith in every possible way, including involvement in mission to the cities, comprehensive health ministry, total member involvement, and the church's I will go strategic plans. I loved what our doctor said last night. The church doesn't have a program for I will stay, only for I will go. Personal and public evangelistic outreach is the lifeblood of the Adventist movement. Reject the Laodicean approach of doing nothing. God wants us to be part of his far-reaching evangelistic efforts. We are chosen for mission. Number 16, neutralization of personal Christian lifestyle and church comportment through worldly influences. Remain faithful to God's injunctions to live a pure and simple lifestyle as a witness to the world of what God can do in a consecrated life. The devil is busy bringing into our lives and church activities evil influences that affect our lifestyles, business activities, music, recreation, entertainment, what we wear, eating and drinking habits in relation to God's health reform and other lifestyle activities. It is my observation, I will tell you again, that God is beginning the shaking and sifting of his precious Advent movement. By God's grace, let us live pure and simple lives in accordance with biblical revival and reformation, reflecting our close relationship with and dependence on Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's take time for daily reading of the Bible, study of the spirit of prophecy, and engaging in earnest prayer, imploring the Lord for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Then let us share with others the wonderful power and salvation of God. We are chosen for mission. Amen. Now these and, and other confusing interruptions by the devil tend to destroy our calling as chosen for mission. Resist those temptations by false teachers to deviate from our biblical beliefs and heaven-sent mission. Otherwise, we will become like 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, which says, these are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. The book of Jude echoes this in verses 12 to 19. They are clouds without water, late autumn leaves without fruit, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for who has reserved the blackness of darkness forever, grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, flattering people to gain advantage, mockers in the last time sensual people who cause divisions not having the spirit. This is the world, my dear fellow leaders and church members, in which we now live. With the devil distracting us from God's mission, but the devil will not succeed because we were chosen for mission. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, it tells us we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of the confusing interruptions to God's mission, God is completely in control of the destiny of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is in control of the proclamation of the Advent movement, in control of the Advent message. God chose us 
to be part of his final cry to the world. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us, my brothers and sisters, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. As indicated, this year, we are focusing on the 160th anniversary of the General Conference itself. Chosen for mission. In Christ, we have our unity, identity, and mission. The General Conference was organized in 1863 and has been fulfilling its mission for 160 years. I want to tell you, we're celebrating that, but it's too long. We should have been in heaven by now. By God's grace, we will not celebrate many more anniversaries on this earth. Amen. We are also focusing on the 150th, and it's important for us to fix it in our minds because this is an important event, the 150th anniversary next year of sending our first missionary, John Nevins Andrews. I had the privilege of attending a great school, not far from here, called John Nevins Andrews School, JNA, we called it. John Evans Andrews, who with his son and daughter left for Switzerland on September 15, 1874. Unfortunately, his dear wife had died earlier in 1872. Despite that, the family went as the first official missionaries of the church settling in Basel, Switzerland. Much work was done to establish God's church in Europe and beyond. John Nevins Andrews died of tuberculosis at the age of 54 in Basel. But he helped to organize God's worldwide focus on mission, which continues to this day. In honor of the 150th anniversary of the first missionary family, going to Switzerland and to renew our focus on mission with greater intensity, we have a very special portion in this sermon on mission refocus. I know I've gone a little bit over time. Maybe some of you are getting hungry. <laughs> the food will be there, don't worry. I want you to patiently walk through the next few minutes in conjunction with the Inter-European Division. We are involved now with the sending of another missionary to Switzerland in the legacy of John Nevins Andrews. Watch this video and see how things unfold. In August 1874, J.N. Andrews filled out his passport application. He was preparing for an overseas journey with his two children. On September 15 of that year, they would sail together for England and then on to Switzerland, the first official overseas missionaries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A small group of Sabbath keepers, many of them watchmakers, had asked the General Conference to send a missionary to support the fledgling work. The window to overseas mission had opened, and soon hundreds of Seventh-day Adventist missionaries would be crisscrossing the globe, carrying a message of hope. Andrews University is named after Jane Andrews, and we remain deeply committed to educating young people for mission and service. Now, nearly 150 years later, we are thrilled that one of our Doctor of Missiology students, Jonathan Contero, will soon be following in the footsteps of Jane Andrews. He and his wife, Abby, and their two children have heard the mission call. Today, Switzerland is a mission field once again. In fact, much of Europe, once a bastion of Christianity, is considered post-Christian, with young people abandoning the faith of their fathers and mothers. Once again, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is calling on a family to serve in Switzerland. 
Although currently serving as church planters in Spain, the Quintero family recently had the opportunity to stand on the shores of America. And as the Andrews family may have done, they looked out toward Europe. To me, it's an inspiration uh, to be in the, in the path and following the steps of a person like uh, Andrews. And for our family, it's also, you know, something that we have prayed a lot about it. We are passionate about mission. We are moving to another country, another language, and, and uh, we ask for your prayers for our family because it's a challenging move. And we, we know for sure that God will be with us, but we need your prayers to, to find the ways that God is preparing for us in Switzerland. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is refocusing its mission resources on the major mission challenges facing us, the 1040 window the large cities, and the growing secular and post-Christian world. As we dedicate this missionary family today, we pray that the Holy Spirit will go before them and that we each will make a fresh recommitment to reach the unreached with hope. It's time. Almost 150 years.